Welcome to Parent Data by Emily Oster. This is Emily. I'm a professor of economics at Brown University and a mom of two. I read a newsletter called Parent Data, and on this podcast, I'll read it to you. If you want to read the newsletter yourself and see more of my writing on parenting and pregnancy, you can sign up for free at www.parentdata.org. You'll get reader stories, Q&As, and other special features in your inbox that I don't share here. And now for today's newsletter. I teach a lot of classes on data to a lot of different audiences, college students, graduate students, business people, people who find me through this newsletter or Instagram. Once I taught a data class to a middle school assembly. My favorite way to start these classes and opening I have used with all of these audiences is this. Here is a fact from the CDC. In 2017 to 2018, 42.7% of Americans were obese. And here's my question. How do they know? This is a simple question, and it's one that many people have a knee-jerk reaction to. Oh, they weighed people. But of course, it's not that simple. They do weigh people, but which people? Who does the weighing? And how do you go from weighing some people to a statement about all Americans? Today, I want to unpack the answers to these questions a bit the way that I would in class. Understanding the answers here is a lens into thinking more generally about where data comes from and whether we can be confident in what it tells us. One important note, I'm using obesity rate throughout today's post because it is a number that is often cited in policy discussions, and it's a good illustration of general principles. There are many good arguments for why BMI-based measures like this do not reflect a person's health and why we should move away from a focus on them. For more on this, I highly recommend Virginia Sole Smith, and we'll be discussing her upcoming book, Fat Talk, Parenting in the Age of Diet Culture, in the newsletter early next year. I'm using this example to talk about analytic concepts, not because there's great value in this particular data point itself. So I want to start by asking what the ideal way to measure this would be from a data standpoint. If you wanted to know the exact right number for this at all times, you'd want to basically force everyone to weigh themselves every day and then have that data be uploaded to some government server. From this, we'd be able to precisely calculate the share of people at any particular weight. Data-wise, great. In other ways, terrifying and horrible. It's not the handmaid's tale over here yet, uh, so this isn't the way this is done. Slightly more realistically, there are a number of existing data sources for this information. A large-scale example is anonymized medical records, which would provide weight from yearly checkups. Apps are another possibility. People who use a fitness or a diet tracker may enter their weight as part of that, Certain diet trackers will link electronically to a scale, so this information is entered automatically. Some states will collect your weight when you apply for or renew a driver's license. In principle, these may seem like a good way to measure America's weight. They're easily accessible in the sense that the information doesn't have to be collected anew, and they possibly cover many, many people. However, there are significant issues with these sources. One is that in some cases, they rely on self-reports, which may not be accurate. A more pernicious issue is that all of these samples are selected in various ways. That is to say, none of them are representative of the full U.S. population. This lack of representativeness is obvious if we think about dieters or the wearers of fitness trackers. But even a population of medical records, while better, may not be representative. People who are engaged with their health, such that they go to the doctor for well visits, are at least in some ways different from those who do not. Using only that population will get a biased estimate of what we want to know. In order to make a statement like the one I attributed to the CDC, we need to have a data from a representative sample of Americans. The simplest way to think about this is a random sample. It is important to say that we do not need to sample all Americans. One of the wondrous magic things about statistics and sampling is that we can sample a subset of people, even quite a small share, and make statements about the whole population. These statements will come with some possible error, but we can quantify that error. But this is only possible if our sample is representative of the whole population. The way the CDC actually gets these data on obesity and on much other health information is with a survey called the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or the NHANES. The NHANES survey began in the 1960s, and it has run in more or less its current form since 1999. 
It includes roughly 5,000 individuals each year, and it's run continuously with data released every two years. The NHANES has two components. There's a survey component, which asks questions about demographics, race, income, education, health conditions, and diet. This is the source for a lot of data on American dietary patterns. Participants do a one or two day dietary recall in which they list everything they eat during those days. We also get detailed information about any existing health conditions and health behaviors. The second component is the examination. This consists of a series of measurements, including medical and dental tests and laboratory tests. It is in this survey segment that the information is collected on weight, along with blood pressure, lab measurements like triglycerides, and so on. This examination portion of the survey is done by NHANES survey people in a series of carefully designed mobile examination units. The NHANES is designed as a representative sample. In an ideal world, the way we do that is randomly choose 5,000 people from the American population of 300 million and survey them. This is infeasible with a study like this for many reasons, most notably that you'd need to get your mobile examination units all over the country. Instead, what the survey does is choose 15 random counties each year and then choose random households within these counties and then random people within those households. This approach allows the researchers to have the mobile units in a smaller number of locations. It also allows them to advertise the existence of the survey and to let people know what's going on. Again, it may seem like magic, but actually this approach to sampling, when done randomly, will give you a representative sample that you can use to reflect the U.S. population. Statistics is cool. That magic, though, happens when you're actually able to survey and examine everyone you sample. That is, the survey picks a set of people within each county, and the ability to draw conclusions based on that subset of the population is reliant on them actually surveying and examining the people that they picked. The main issue with this is non-response. Not everyone you contact wants to be surveyed, and even fewer people want to be weighed and have their blood drawn. It takes time, it can be invasive, in the data, about half the people contacted are willing to be surveyed and slightly fewer are willing to undergo the examination. If the refusal was random, this would be okay. You'd need to start with twice as many people, but you'd still do all right on being representative. The problem is that refusal is not random. For example, likely due to longstanding issues of mistreatment by the medical system, black individuals are less likely to opt into the survey than those of other races. More educated individuals are more likely to agree to be surveyed, on average, as are richer people. This means that the sample you get is not random, and the data cannot simply be used as it is. The NHANES approaches, say, 10,000 people to get 5,000 responses, but even though the 10,000 people were randomly selected, the 5,000 are not. At the end of the NHANES process, there is a data set of 5,000 individuals. On average, there are more white people in the sample than the overall population, and more people with more education, among other imbalances. Reporting the obesity rate in the observed data would not be representative of the overall population. So what do you do? The short answer is that you, quote, reweight the data. Imagine that your data is on 10 people, nine white people and one black person. But your overall population has seven white people and three black people. If you want your data to represent your population, you need to count your one black person three times and each of your white people only seven ninths of a time. In doing this, you are giving more weight to the person representing the group you do not have enough of and less weight to the people you have too many of. This reweighting can get very complicated because the sample is imbalanced in a lot of ways. Typically, the weight is done by, is by grouping people based on a set of characteristics. For example, 20 to 39-year-old non-Hispanic white women living in urban areas with an intermediate median income of the area. And then asking how the share of the people in the survey with that set of characteristics compares with the share of the overall U.S. population. Participants in this group are then assigned a survey weight, which tells researchers whether to up or down weight them in any overall statistics. There are two important subtleties to this. The first is that in order to do this, you need a good number of people in each group. If there is literally one black person in your entire sample, you cannot count them for the entire black population of the U.S. 
One implication of this is that a survey like the NHANES starts out by oversampling smaller population groups to make sure they have enough people to do their weighting. A second issue, more pernicious, is that you can only weight based on things you see. This was brought home to me by a reader email about a survey in the UK. It has a similar feel. Here's the email. I've just signed up for the UK Future Health Study. I live in an ethnically diverse city with significant areas of deprivation. However, at the initial screening, I was struck by how similar the cohort was. Mostly white, middle-aged professionals who worked in the city, or at least had a job where they could get time off to attend. I'd say 75% had a Garmin fitness watch or equivalent, and we were all quite excited to get a free cholesterol check. Some of the issues this person identifies, imbalances in race or age, are things we can deal with using the weighting procedures described. But some of these features, like Garmin ownership, are not things we measure, and therefore not things we can base our weights on. The bottom line is that if the non-response to a survey like the NHANES is in part a function of unobservable differences across people, which it surely is, then we retain concerns about lack of representativeness. It can be difficult to know how important this is in magnitude or even sometimes what directions it biases our conclusions. We can sometimes speculate, but we cannot be sure. I wish I could tell you that there is a good way to address these problems. It is a topic I've studied in my academic work. I have a paper called A Simple Approximation for Evaluating External Validity Bias, written with the incomparable Isaiah Andrews. But we do not come up with any airtight solutions. The fundamental problem is that if your sample is selected based on features you cannot see, unobservables, then you are out of luck for making precise conclusions. To summarize, when we want to make statements about characteristics of whole populations, be they the entire U.S. or something smaller or larger, we must use representative samples. If my goal was to get the weight of 5,000 people, there are much simpler ways to collect that data than mobile clinics across the U.S., I could weigh people at the New York City Marathon or people who go to a Packers game. Those approaches, though, will yield a biased sample. Yet even when we do our very, very best to sample in a representative way, we still run into problems if not everyone responds, and they do not. We can upweight or downweight, and even when we do that, we are still not usually all the way there. It is better than the Packers game. but It's not perfect, though. The issues here come up all the time if you're looking for them. Political polling, for example. Pollsters randomly sample people to call, but they definitely do not get a random sample of people answering them. There are many reweighting approaches to addressing these imbalances, but they do all run into the problem of unobservable selection, and also in that case, lying, but that's for another day. It is worth looking for these issues. We spend a lot of time in this newsletter, in media in general, talking about issues like correlation versus causation. Those are important, but the more mundane question of where does data come from and what does it really measure? This is crucially important too. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, subscribe to Parent Data in your favorite podcast app and rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to the whole newsletter for free at www.parentdata.org. Talk to you soon.